Previously in Call of Cthulhu, Obelisk Obsession. One boiling evening in May, Claudia Eddy, an occultist of some renown in Massachusetts, threw a party in her Bostonian mansion, inviting dilettantes and savants alike. Of course, she invited a few of her selected friends. Eugene Gore, a world-known Belgian antiquarian with a down-to-earth, straight-to-the-point attitude. The posh old Dr. Warner and his fame-seeking granddaughter, Veronica Warner. And Howard Hammermeister, a bootlegger doubling as a bodyguard so as long as money kept coming. Howard, sulked by the front door, enjoying a well-deserved cigarette by the moonlight, sweating beads. Boy, it is hot in there. Miss Eddy should really get rid of all these heavy tapestries and curtains. It is suffocating, said Howard, hardly breathing through the smoke. Good evening, Howard, is it? I am but terrible with faces in my old age. It has been some time since we saw each other. Not since that dreadful incident at the asylum near Salem. Chirpily announced George Warner in a thick British accent, before turning to his granddaughter in hushed tones. Ronnie? Please, darling, try not to embarrass yourself tonight. I do not want to tarnish the Warner reputation more than you've already soiled it. I'll do the talking, and you just bat your eyelashes. With a bit of luck, we'll find a suitable bourgeois lad for you. Honestly, Grandpapa, you're the rudest man. Couldn't you wait for Howard to be out of earshot? Said Veronica, fuming before storming the front door and handing her mantle to a butler. Youth! They never learn, coughed George to Howard before shuffling inside. Thank you again, Eugene, for delivering this rare piece. Oh, darlings, you are all here. How nice of you to come. This is positively perfect. Our old friend Lawrence Croswell is here, and he would simply love to have a chat. It is his first outing since they fixed him right up after that terrible business in Danvers. So be so kind as not to press him too much with questions. Ah, le pauvre, il est ici mal en point, recalled Eugene. Claudia ushered her company into one of the many boudoirs on the ground floor of her mansion. Lawrence Croswell, a specialist in New England folklore, leaned against a window sill, his eyes peering through the night sky before gazing toward the party. How marvelous to see you all again, friends. His face lost all countenance as he lurched himself into a monologue. As you know, in September of last year, researchers from Arkham's Miskatonic University set sail for the Antarctic continent on a bold venture of exploration and discovery. The Miskatonic University Antarctic Expedition, led by Professors Lake and Dyer, left Boston Harbor in two ships. Two months later, they landed in Antarctica, near Ross Island, Twenty men, fifty-five dogs, and five large Dornier aeroplanes were set upon the ice. Their mission was to survey a geologic history of the Earth's last frontier, to chart from the air where no human foot had stepped, and to determine at last, once and for all, whether Antarctica was indeed one land mass or several. However, if you recall correctly, we only remember the Miskatonic expedition for its final tragic failure. They were never heard from again. On the afternoon of January 24th, a tremendous Antarctic gale swept the campsite, killing every man in Professor Lake's party and scattering his samples, notes, and equipment beyond recovery. A rescue mission the following day found only silence, useless scraps of machinery, and a few pathetic remains of the tragedy. None of the men at Lake's camp ever returned home. The remainder of the expedition retreated north a few days later. He took a pause, as if his explanation tore at his very soul. Lawrence turned his gaze back to the sky. You see, some of these people, they were very close to my friend. Professor Moore of the Miskatonic University. He is mounting an expedition to Antarctica to unearth what happened. He is not going alone, a longtime friend of his, the explorer James Starkweather, said will be joining. They could use every bit of help, both muscle and brains, but most importantly, finances. Miss Eddy, 
I implore you to help them out. They are starting recruitment this month and plan to depart in the fall. The group deliberated a while and decided to head to New York to meet with the two heads of the expedition. Claudia Eddy drove a hard bargain, financing the expedition to a fine amount, striking a deal with the respectable professor and the brash, if not vulgar, Starkweather. What an insufferable prick! hissed Claudia getting out of the interview with the two leaders. The investigators met with a police inspector, Jeremiah, who reluctantly joined the expedition to get funds to save his boy, severely ill in Boston. They struck a careful alliance in preparing for the expedition ahead. Before going back to Boston, after their interviews in May, the team decided to speak with survivors of the first expedition to the Antarctic, but they were met by odd testimonies and strong reluctance to speak about the events. When the party comes back to New York for departure in September, the Starkweather Moor expedition has been in the news for the past few months. Newspapers and radios feature occasional coverage about Starkweather and his plans. Equipment and supplies have been trickling into the expedition warehouses for weeks. Now the final days are at hand. The ship is docked, the last supplies are purchased, and the various members of the party arrive in a group at the expedition's ad hoc headquarters, the Amherst Hotel. The party goes through medical examinations, first fittings for Arctic wear, and a photo session occurs. The departure is scheduled for September 14th. During the big kickoff meeting over breakfast, Ronnie is approached by Professor Moore to take care of the Captain J.B. Douglas when he arrives on the 6th of September. The rest of the day is spent by the team in taking care of the cargo, ensuring that nothing goes missing. They soon realize that Starkweather's organizational skills are quite lacking. A lot is missing or in disarray. It takes the group of investigators quite a while to settle the scores and right the wrongs of the cargo lists. In the middle of the night, Eugene is awoken by pounding on the floor above his room. He promptly wakes up everyone and they head to the Amherst Hotel's fourth floor where a fuming Starkweather yells, Get me another woman. That hag of Acacia Lexington is going south on September 10th. We're moving our departure to September 9th. Do you hear me, old chap? Meanwhile, George receives a crackpot letter ominously mentioning that his friends and himself shouldn't head south. But disaster strikes yet again. The expedition is caught up in the aftermath of a serious crime, the apparent murder of Commander J.B. Douglas. The commander's death catapults the expedition directly into the news, adding a sensational thread to the popular coverage. The press begins to play up the story, asking who might have it in for the expedition and what the murderer has to gain. Privately, the investigators are wondering the same things. The group divides up. Howard, smelling something fishy, decides to stick to the SS Gabriel, the boat outfitted for the expedition, and ensure that no one sabotages the cargo or the hull. Ronnie knows the location of Douglas's rooms at the Westbury Hotel and embarks Claudia and George with her whilst Eugene keeps on researching the Antarctic and the steps of the first expedition in various libraries. Ronnie's group takes the opportunity to visit the captain's lodgings, finding a few pieces of the puzzle in the remnants of the dead man's things. There is not enough evidence to point a finger at the murderer or to determine just what he was after, but the hints they find cause the investigators to begin digging behind the scenes. Unfortunately, the police is called to the scene mid-investigation. Detective Jeremiah in tow. He walks into the room where Claudia, Roni and George are barely hidding. The chief detective, Jay Hansen, apprehends everyone, including Jeremiah by association. Professor Moore bails out the team of misfits out of jail and gives them a stern lecture about their behavior. Scandal articles begin appearing in the yellow press, tarnishing the reputation of the expedition and the investigators. Claudia, Eugene and Ronnie 
decide to lay low. Going to the library to fish out more information about the previous expedition, but also about Starkweather's fierce rival, Acacia Lexington. Getting banned from several public libraries in the process for trying to corrupt and romancing the staff. Oh, mister, please show us to the section about New York's elite. They are ever so fascinating. Ronnie, have you no dignity left? I cannot believe that idiotic bookworm didn't take my money. It is an outrage. They uncover that Acacia traveled to Africa with Starkweather, where the Englishman saved her from a perilous rafting incident in Congo. Deciding to speak with Miss Lexington, Claudia prepared a gift basket and headed for the suburbs. There, she saw someone being abducted, but preferred to feign ignorance, and headed to the door where she was rebuked by the butler. Honestly, where did politeness go these days? Good God! The following days are spent with more sleuthing and ensuring that the cargo is ready for departure. Unfortunately, Detective Jeremiah removed himself from the expedition as he learned of the passing of his son. Claudia promptly suggested Wilbur Ozenich, a provider of stolen goods. You are going to have a tremendous time, William, I promise. It's Wilbur, Claudia. Absolutely, Wilfred. The team of investigators continued their preparation, uncovering some dark past of Acacia's family. Her father committing suicide, the robbing of his unique copy of Arthur Gordon Pym by Poe with unpublished additional chapters, his ties to social nationalists in Germany. By nighttime, the investigators are invited to move into the ship for the departure the subsequent day. Alas, a loud explosion roared on the docks. It was a sabotage attempt on the Gabriel, which was swiftly foiled by the investigators, allowing them to gain the trust of stark weather. Unfortunately, the damages delayed the party's sailing date, allowing the Lexington expedition to get underway first. Suspicion is cast on Acacia Lexington once more, but nothing can be proven. The investigators uncover that the famous Russian painter and socialite Rorik had ties with Lexington. Thankfully, Wilbur and Eugene know him well and decide to meet with Rorik. They find a beaten up man, bruised all over. He was the man who got abducted in front of Acacia's mansion. His assailants were German and stole a folder sent by Professor Dyer, once a good friend of his and one of the key surviving members of the Miskatonic expedition who vanished close to Hawaii earlier this year. Royerick wished to discuss a matter of some personal concern. As an old friend of the Lexington family, he is concerned for her safety and wishes the investigators to undertake to do what they can to sniff out the source of these attacks and to ensure that both Antarctic expeditions return safely. In the back of his mind, Moore does not decide whether Douglas's death was a random slaying or another form of sabotage. Finally, on September 11th, the Gabrielle departs New York City for Melbourne, Australia. The trip is anything but dull. As the members of the expedition soon discover, there is still much to do before they reach the ice. Nevertheless, after the frantic pace of the past two weeks, the first few days at sea seem like an idyllic pleasure cruise. Nothing unusual occurs during the journey to Panama, and the investigators have ample opportunity to get to know one another and the other expedition members. On board, a rumour of Starkweather's bad luck start to spread. The steward Henning, hired by a mysterious figure to cripple the expedition, embarks on a program of quiet sabotage. The investigators must find and stop the saboteur before he can ruin their chances, or it seems, kill them all. A suspicious and superstitious crew, carefully coached by Henning, adds appreciably to the difficulty. Tired and exhausted by the sabotages, the investigator mistake a hazing typical of sea voyage that nearly costed them their ticket aboard the ship. You will drop me at the first port. Do you hear me? Ça va pas la tête? Sacre bleu! Seamen are positively mean. The investigators apprehend Henning after much sleuthing aboard. His last huzzah, or so they think, 
is the sabotage of the fridges. By the time the ship reaches Melbourne, Henning is thankfully in custody. The investigators have a few days in port while the expedition replaces the items that were lost or destroyed, and then it is time to sail south to the ice at last. Before reaching land, they face mighty gales that nearly killed Wilbur during the rescue of one of the rotary motors of one of the three planes sabotaged by Henning. An unpleasant surprise. With Henning safely out of the way and his sabotage revealed, the officers and crew of the Gabriel are outwardly friendly. Rumours of Starkweather's bad luck are still whispered below decks, but misfortune has been seen to wear a human face. Passengers and crew work hard together, and everyone looks forward to the dangerous excitement of the pack ice. On their way, they encounter the wreck of a lost whaler is found locked in the ice, its sad mute tail waiting to be uncovered. Soon enough, the investigators hit Antarctica, with the two competing expeditions on the Ross Ice Shelf. An explosion and fire at the Lexington base camp, started by two men driven mad by snow craze, causes the Starkwither Moor expedition to attempt a rescue. The meeting forces the leaders of the two groups to speak to one another at last and to form an Unisi truce in order to conquer the ice. The investigators learn that the Lexington expedition has suffered from as many mishaps and acts of sabotage as their own party, and that Acacia Lexington firmly places the blame for it all on James Starkweather's shoulders. Too eager to explore Starkweather leaves in the early morning aboard the aircraft Enderby, to explore the mountains by himself, he wants to be the first to be up there. The Enderby comes back in the same afternoon. The uneasy alliance of Starkweather Moor and Lexington flies to Lakes Camp in the foothills of the astonishing Miskatonic Mountains. There at last, they unearth the remains of Lake's ill-fated party and begin to uncover the awful truth of what really happened at the feet of the mountains. All that is here are memories, remnants left behind by the other expedition. Lake's own finds remain as well. The fossil caves, the buried body of an odd creature beneath one of the snow mounds, and add their own spice to the tale. Despite their impromptu alliance, the relationship between the Lexington and Starkweather parties is not good. She quickly rues her dependence upon Starkweather's group and opens negotiations with the Barsmeyer Falcon Expedition, BFE, a German expedition that launched roughly at the same time. The subsequent arrival of the BFE advance party changes the balance of power once again, irking and angering most of the investigators who reluctantly agree to Acacia's terms to get the Germans over. She only wishes to be free of Starkweather's influence and carve her own name in history, not be eternally tied to the shadow of a man. Besides, the Germans only wish safe transport over the mountains as their planes can fly long distances but not high altitudes.